Hello, everyone. So my name is Phil. I'm the managing director of Radicare Adventures. So this is the second day of our training for uh, Redeemer Cathedral Church. So for today's training, we're really talking about um, continuing our conversation from last week, but really talking about the more practical thing that's happening at the church property. So the common situations we encounter. Uh, how do you interact with people who may be laying in front of the doorway, maybe, you know, you know, using a washroom in an appropriate fashion uh, or being constructed in the church property? So that's what kind of things we'll be talking about today. So maybe I'll, well, we can do a round of introduction. Um, so I'll pass it to Zoe, who's our first volunteer for Radicare Adventures. Okay. Yeah. Hello, my name is Zoe. Nice to meet everyone. Yeah, I'm a first-year student at UFC, oh. and yeah, I've known Bill for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And is inner city work something you're interested in, or yeah. you said, uh, yeah, yeah. And I'm Sandy, and I'm with Diane. <laughs> my mask is unfortunately a bit in the dust this morning, but I'm going to make the best of it. Go ahead, Diane. I'm Diane, and um, when I was in that first group with Wendy and Ruth, when we read the, um, the book together, that, that kind of sparked something. So mm -hmm. now we're back in town. I just came to, I feel completely inadequate, everything to do with encountering the focus on the property. So I'm just glad for all the help you're giving us. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm Ruth, a member of the cathedral for a long time, and I spend a lot of time down here through Open Cathedral and the Pro Arts and um, Building and Maintenance Committee. So I yeah. uh, spend a lot of time in this area and want to learn more about how best to interact. I'm Matt, and I'm the digital media director for the cathedral. Um, but in, in my past life slash current life, I work in theater, and I've done we did a project called the Bottle Picker Monologues, which I kind of touched on a lot of similar stuff. Um, so a workshop presentation that I led with downstage theater. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of work in, in community. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, I'm always interested to learn. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do we have any like questions from last week? Uh, we talked. So for last week, we talked about more like homelessness in general. Yeah, I do actually. Yeah. Um, suppose we found. Yeah. Um, places for everybody who wanted a place. Okay. How many people would still, what percentage approximately are people who are mentally, have some kind of a mental disorder and would not want to go into any kind of facility but would still be on the street? I, I know this is really, you, well, you, it, it's a, it's conjecture at best but so I guess my question is what kind of space are you talking about is this an emergency apartment. shelter space because we have tons of space right yeah. or are we talking about like actual single room um, homes. homes yeah because that's very different yeah, yeah. no I'm not I'm talking about independent living okay yeah um, so in Calgary we have different levels of support as well so there is it ranges from permanent base a place based support housing we have a caseworker that's 24 7 with clients. So they have their own place, but there's always a caseworker on site. Um, and then there's, you know, to scatter site housing, is what we call it, and that's more of a community based housing. So people are independently living there or living with a roommate, et cetera. So the reason why we have this wide range is because not everyone's going to be able to live independently um, mm. because that's just impossible if you're. You know, living homeless for 10 years and you're transitioning to that space, you don't know the life skills, even to cook. Structure time is important for folks, right? And having unstructured time is very difficult for folks to transition into when saw adequate support. So that's why we have permanent based support housing. I don't know and I can't tell you the percentage because that, that I, I just don't know. That's yeah. very hypothetical, but I can tell you there's definitely a, a high, high number of folks who will not be able to do independent living all by themselves. And that's why place-based supportive housing uh, exists mm -hmm. as, a, as a kind of a support. And that's also permanent, right? So it doesn't require a person to leave. It's not transitional. 
So it could real well be is that person lives there until they die because it's their home, right? They have, they have their own room, own community there. So it is, um, you know, we, we call that exiting the homelessness mm -hmm. situation because they have that place to themselves. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But there's also members of the homeless community who, who choose to live rough. Well, so, so yeah, well, I want to be careful by saying that. Choose to live rough because the alternative is living in a shelter. Yes, absolutely. If, if that's, that's kind of the choices, we're definitely seeing that people are choosing to live rough because they do not want to go into an emergency shelter. But if there is housing available for them, I can guarantee you probably 90% of them will say, yeah, I want to go back to yeah, housing yeah. with support, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And is the primary yeah. reason not wanting to be in shelter because they don't feel safe? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not safe, violence, stuff getting stealing and so on. No privacy, right? Um, diseases. It's actually mm. quite a big one. Because I, like, when, when I went into, so I did a research, I'm in the process of doing research right now. It's a qualitative, qualitative study. And it, it was kind of inspired because we're seeing a high number of people sleeping rough outside. And we're wondering why? There are shelter spaces available. Calgary is well adequate. So is Edmonton mm. now to handle everyone who, who can be in, in shelter if they want to. Yeah. There still be spaces. Um, so why are people not going? And the uh, main reason is that, you know, cleanliness, no privacy actually is a big one. Um, violence and, uh, you know, if you got pets, you automatically get disqualified, right? There's no shelter that's pet friendly. Um, and then last, you know, the big, the, the last one I asked was about their health and people actually perceive. So this is their own perception. Doesn't mean this reality, but they perceive their health to be better a lot of times when they're staying outside rather than inside. And I ask them why, and they're saying, well, I mean, if you look at a shelter, you got so many people in there. You don't know who's got what kind of communicable disease, right? Back and forth. It's easily you'll be transmittable. And looking at like, you know, lice, scabies, stuff like that, very, very, very easily transmittable in a shelter environment where there's hundreds of people living there. And there's not adequate hygiene for everyone, right? Um, that went into, into winter, it's even worse. So like the last time I worked, which is uh, last week, there's tons of people getting sick, you know? Mm -hmm. And once one person gets sick, then that entire area, those people get infected as well. So it's not good. Can I ask what you mean by not adequate hygiene in the shelters? Yeah, so there's not, um, so there are showers available for folks. But there's not hundreds of showers. So there's always take it. You know what I mean? Like there's about like ten probably or fifteen. We're we're nowhere talking about like thirty or forty shower stalls. And there's only certain time in which you're allowed to go to the showers. Uh, and this will be during, for example, you know, afternoon shifts so it will be after like about you know, after lunch, so about twelve one PM, about close about five PM. That times where you do your laundry, that's it. That's the only time you do your laundry, right? There's a one staff managed that day hygiene area. Afterwards, it's closed because we're serving dinner. And after that, people are going up to their floors. There's no laundry services after. That's the only block that you have. And then when they go up the floors, you, they usually take, you know, depending on their, their lineup, about an hour or two to actually get a spot. By the time they get their spot, it's 8 p.m. Ish. So then you have to like rush to get showers and stuff like that. But people don't are not comfortable leaving their stuff. That's too. what I was gonna say. So if they're in the shower, their stuff mm -hmm. is, is there for someone to take. Or well, they just part. take their stuff in the shower, which is not great. Yeah. Oh. So yeah, yeah. That's why there's not there's not adequate and also like there's only limited spots. So if people are using the showers and can't use them, right? So um, and there's limited lockers. So people have wait wait lists for lockers as well. And afternoon shifts, so my shift usually do not do lockers. You wait until night to get the, you know, sign up for a locker. And they gotta wait until one opens up. Yeah. So there's not there's not a lot of hygiene solution, um, even for folks to stay in shelter. Now I imagine people staying outside. There's there really isn't any. Um, there are some facilities for the winter times are starting to open up to author showers like once a week or stuff like that. 
um, but those are usually very selective locations. It's not, it's pretty hard to get around, right? Yeah. And that's why most uh, folks, they address hygiene through just going to a, you know, a bathroom and they use the water from the sink to kind of wash up and even in clothes as well. That's why people spend a lot of time washing. Uh, it's usually because they're washing up stuff. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, any more questions? Okay. Because we can go into kind of the common situations that we see at the church. I'll let you guys kind of brainstorm and we can address them kind of one by one, the situations. Which ones should we talk about first? <laughs> well, um, there was one where the iPhone particularly um, difficult to um, observe where a woman mm -hmm. came in and uh, there was a, um, I think the queen had okay. just died. She and, okay. and, and then she stamped on, stomped on the, uh, uh, through the, the uh, portrait um, of the queen on the floor, stomped on it, and she was going to uh, keep doing it. And, uh, you know, she was escorted. Yeah, out, and, um, but she was, uh, she was a real handful. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think eventually she left and went off some but um, it was very disruptive. Yeah. And um, I don't know, maybe it was uh, because she was on drugs or, or her, she didn't get her meds or whatever. But um, I was wondering whether, you know, the whole time I was wondering, uh, are the, the ushers who are dealing with her, are they in actual physical danger? I mean, she could have a knife or, um, I mean, or these, these were the kinds of thoughts that were going through my head. Yeah, and it, it just, uh, or is this just a crazy person that we can uh, escort out without any problem? But mm -hmm. it's this uncertainty yeah. and it's knowing how to be firm and compassionate at the same time. Yeah. And, and knowing, well, I guess, what are the resources? Who are the resources that we could call on? And um, <clears throat> is there anything, what behaviors on our part will set the person at ease mm -hmm. and maybe diffuse the situation? Yeah. So, you know, yeah. there's a whole constellation of things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's unpack that. So we have you know, an individual who is disruptive and, and damaging property inside the church. And was this uh, kind of within when there's a lot of benches around or is it outside? It's, a, it's inside, inside the church. Inside, it's inside the, church. the sanctuary. Yeah, not remember well that one. <laughs> yeah, she was like sitting for a while and everything was sort of fine and then she would get up and wander towards like the very front of the cathedral okay. while, while uh, Helen at the time was speaking. Right. Um, and everyone kind of just like left her to her devices a little bit. I mean, people were kind of slowly <laughs> trying to corner her a little bit so that she would wander around a little bit less. But, mm. uh, and then I think... I think we might have called 911. Yeah, I, I was hesitant too because of some other situation that come up where we were kind of warned off that, but then, yeah, then Michael recalled. And we were told, yeah, that is exactly what you do. That's the case where 911. Yeah. It's yeah. tough because like, you don't want to approach her and make her more feel, you know, like trapped. trapped. Yeah. yeah. And so it, it, that's kind of a tough thing where I'm not sure either. Do you do you try and approach and escort her somewhere? Or? Well, that depends on, so I, I always say, depends on a person's comfort level, right? That is your safety is the most utmost important thing. If someone was like that and I was around, I'd probably be able to, you know, kind of approach that person and, 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 and um, try to escort her. But I, I just want to say, just to preface, like, the things that we talk about here are, like, in theory, right? Yeah. So if you don't feel comfortable doing that in your life, don't push yourself. 
because that's your own personal limit, right? So recognizing that your limitation, your concerns is important, right? Um, so one biggest thing, like, yeah, I mean, call them, there's, okay, I, I was gonna say there's no wrong type of call number one, but yeah, there are wrong types of call number one, but that would be an adequate situation where you can call number one, right? The person's destroying property, they're, they're being disruptive, and uh, they're inside, and they even pose, pose danger, right? So, um, but at the same time, you know, when we're escorting that person out, you know, a lot of times, you know, it's uh, it's about a balance of of your tone as well as your posture with the situation, and you're never gonna get. So we also have to end, think about our end goal. The end goal is to get this person out, right? Just get them out without physically touching this person, without anyone getting hurt. That's your objective. It's not gonna look pretty, right? Person's gonna cuss you out. <laughs> They're still going to cuss you out, even though you're employing nonviolent crisis intervention, right? So the goal of MVCI, nonviolent crisis intervention, is not to like have a very, you know, you know, a jolly talking and get the person down in a situation where they're going to, you know, respect you. The person in that situation is to get the person out without further escalating into, you know, having law enforcement involved or having more property damage or having people hurt, right? So with that in mind. You know, sometimes it's it's really just approaching that person and you know giving them space um, because you don't want too close, right? Too close can inflict that kind of fight or flight, but you're not giving them a chance to flight, so <laughs> default to fight, right? <laughs> um, and and uh, it's you know I, I will kind of begin by saying like, hey, what's going on? It seems like you're just by observation. Seems like you look quite upset and you're stomping on this, on the equipment here. And they might just flip you off. They might just say, you know, fuck you, you know, why are you talking to me? You know, stuff like that. So when they do that, they, they, they kind of pull up the conversation with, I, I can see that you're frustrated, but you know, you're stomping on this, right? It, it is a church property, which you want it to be respectful, right? So you gotta have lay these communications before. And it may not be re accepted, but that's okay. But you can't jump from zero to, Threat, right? People don't take threats well. No one does, right? So things that will not be helpful will be, I'm gonna call 911 right now if you don't leave, right? So let's reframe that. Let's give them options, right? So you can be firm and say something like, the options are, you know, we can go out and here's even maybe like offering something in return for going out. Mm -hmm. We can, let's have a conversation outside and let's have a cigarette. A lot of times that is an actual very important like crisis de-escalation point is cigarettes. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. the other option is I, I'm going to have to call 911. So presenting two options, right? Um, and then in the end, giving them a time frame of, of completing that. And if they don't follow through with what they have, the consequence is going to be, right? Uh, so that usually is how we kind of address those situations um, is to start communicating. The person's not receptive at all. They give very clear directions. So we don't even need to use solo words. We don't need to use unfortunately or we don't need to explain. It's just very simple. Hey, there's two options here. Let's have a conversation outside and let's, let's talk. Let's have a cigarette. The second option is we ha we're, we're getting someone to remove you. Simple as that, right? Two options, restating them. They know what, which ones, right? Because when when someone is you know in a very you know heightened mood, they're not processing what you're trying to say, right? So using the least amount of words to clear to give very clear directive is important so that they actually know what you're trying to say. We need cigarettes and matches in that. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cigarettes at the back. Well, actually, that is a, mm -hmm. is a critical tool to de escalate situations. Um, you, you know, like, so when there's one side of my agency, it was uh, this is lady just got flipped out because a gentleman was using the washroom and didn't clean it up. And, you know, I, I was, was not a client doing wound care. <laughs> then I got out. She, she was very agitated. She was going to the person. Now, I am comfortable, so I step in in between them. And I, and then, because usually, most of the times they're directing their anger at the other person, and I have previous uh, report with this person. Mm -hmm. So my 
you know, and there's also no wrong way of doing this. There's different ways of approaches, and it just depends on personality, right? And you can trial and error. If this doesn't work well, reflect on the action and then kind of see what can improve, right? Sometimes if you're being too serious, uh, it can escalate as well. So your tone really is important too, right? Um, but, you know, like I'm more serious type of person, whereas my coworker is like more chill. So they're more like, hey, let's just go outside and have a cigarette. You know, let's talk about this. And their methods worked a lot better, more receptive to the person in the end. So then eventually she went out, she got her cigarette, she was more calm afterwards, right? So we didn't have to call 911 for the situation. We didn't have anyone getting hurt, right? So, yeah, I mean, the fight still happened. It is going to happen because there's verbal conflict back and forth. But the situation in the end is no one's getting physically contacted. No property's getting, you know, damaged. And the situation eventually calmed down, right? So that's kind of like the goal of crisis intervention. It's how do you use words to de-escalate a situation? And that de-escalation can mean still mean this person's still heightened, they're still angry, they're still mad, but at least they're doing the things that you want them to do, right? which is maybe leave the property um, or go somewhere else. That's not there, so they're not. Or stop the action of damaging property. Okay, so, yeah. okay now, um, I guess this shows my ignorance about people's behavior while on drugs, but what if the person is just not from the cognitive functions are completely impaired mm -hmm. and you know you can't really um, offer those two alternatives and have them be able to process them. well usually so the reason why we only offer two options and use simple words is because person's cognitive is cognition is being affected okay so usually people can't understand the still okay. the, the simple uh, you know, requests or options, right? You go outside, let's have a smoke, or I'm gonna have to call someone to get you removed, right? So, you, a person who usually understand that. Even when a person may be acting erratic and they may be, you know, um, schizophrenic or something on top. Of yeah, well, right. But, you know, like, even when they're under mental health conditions, stuff right. like that, they can still understand what you're trying to communicate okay. most of the times, okay. right? Um, and, you know, also you can physically guide them, right? So what that means is the position where you're at, if, so the, the biggest thing is, like, if I don't want this person to go to the front, if someone is at the front, you're usually going to avoid that person, right? So if you have a person kind of just go into the front and just kind of, block that way off, they'll probably usually go the other way uh, because they don't want to be, a, especially they don't, if they already identify, they don't like you, right? So they don't want to go where you're at, right? So if you situationally, situationally place yourself where you don't want this person to go, they'll probably choose the other way to go okay. as well. But you always offer them an escape route. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because if you don't, then what's going to happen now? My fly option is gone. Now the only thing I can do is fight, right? Um, and this, this also is important just to be aware of where you're at because you also want to have an escape for yourself, right? <laughs> so you don't want to be cornering yourself in a position where there is no room for you to move and maneuver because that's a very dangerous situation. Just thinking about a situation one, right? So let's say this is a wall. If you're at here and the person is over here, sure, you can leave this way, right? But if there's someone over here, maybe get that person to move out of your way. You don't want two people at the same place as well, right? Because then you're impeding on each other's escape route, but also you're kind of boxing them in, right? Two people like this. I always want to have, you know, if I have other staff, I'll just have them angle themselves in a slightly different position so that you're kind of creating more coverage as well, right? So that's, that's the other way that you can kind of position yourself situationally. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I'm interested in one of the examples you brought up right at the start, thinking of Ruth with open cathedral, where you come and there's someone right across the doorway sleeping or something. Just how to mm -hmm. have that kind of situation. Those ones are usually much out, uh, especially if the person is just sleeping. Mm -hmm. 
It's simple. It's it, it's really just getting down to your level, asking them, hey, you know, we're, we're opening the door here. It, this is a access point for people to come in and out. I'm just going to ask you if you could move yourself over there. Especially if, you know, they're just sleeping. They're not damaging property. They're not doing anything. Um, and if, if, it, if you guys feel comfortable, like just allowing them another position to sleep. Usually where escalation occurs, especially when security, is because you're not offering an alternative. The alternative is to leave. <laughs> but leave where, right? So if the lawn is open and there's absolutely no one there and it's fine for the person to sleep there, saying like, hey, you just need to move a little bit over there is a lot better than you got to go. You can't remain on property at all, right? So that's, that's also where you can set the difference between how we treat people at, here at the church versus how other properties treat people. Because sometimes people do seriously just need sleep, right? And they literally cannot sleep anywhere. Public property, they're going to be, you know, kicked out by bad off. Private property, they're going to get kicked out by police. So where are they going to stay except for shelters where they don't feel safe? So there's literally no other alternative. So always, if you're asking someone to do something, you know, like have an option for them to actually do that, right? So that, that's really important. But yeah. So like, I remember a couple weeks back, there was just one gentleman who was just sleeping. So I, I, I kind of just engaged, had a very civil conversation. It was, it was more about, you know, hey, what we're doing here, like we're cleaning up, maintaining the space. I know you've got some stuff around. I just ask you to, you know, if you got garbage, throw it in this garbage can over here, and if you can just maintain, right? It's a very respectful conversation. And a person, you know, they, they're like, yeah, absolutely, no worries. I'll clean up after myself, and uh, I'll make sure I don't leave the stuff around. questions yeah and last week so before like our session so there was this one lady in the, in the washroom so a lot of times you're gonna find it's difficult to communicate with someone because they don't make sense they literally they are talking you just can't make sense of what they're talking about and it's okay to interrupt them and say hey you're slurring for example I can't understand what you're saying could you please speak a bit louder it's okay to say that because if you don't and they continue on and it finished, you expect an answer from you, they're like, sorry, what? <laughs> right? That's not, that's usually create more frustration. And also, if you just cannot get what this person trying to say, it's okay to step in and redirect the conversation. For example, the, the, the lady in the washroom, she thought that she had diabetes. She did not, does not have diabetes. She injected herself with suboxone, which is not insulin, right? So I, I already know that, like, we, we're not, going to be able to effectively communicate about that stuff. But that's not important either way. The most important thing is that we're going to get her moved outside to mm -hmm. another location. So I interrupted her conversation. And I was like, all right, so what is our plan for the rest of the day? Right? She was like, oh, I'm going to go, see, go to Dia. I'm going to see maybe some of my friends. I'm like, cool, OK. Do you think we can maybe start packing up and so we can do that? And then she started packing up. As she was packing up, she started, you know, talking about her stuff, and she kind of stopped. So I was like, do you need any help, right? Just stepping in, saying, hey, do you, go, do you need any help? Maybe I can help you pack up the stuff. Right? She was like, oh, no, 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 I got it. I'm like, okay, no worries. This is all while she's still in the bathroom? Yeah, so she got to pack up her stuff, right? She was packing up her stuff, and I was like, all right, well, sounds good. Seems like you packed up. Let's move out this way, and then we can talk while we're going out. So we're talking, we're moving as well. And I just directed her physically using my hand. It's like, hey, this way to your left. I'm gonna go straight. And she was very respectful afterwards. Right? So sometimes it's like, you know, it's really redirection of a conversation. You don't need to make sense of what they're talking about. That's not important, right? Especially if your end goal is, you know, get this person out. So that's that's what we did last last week. So that was that was a good interaction, right? Um, Sorry, what was she injecting herself with? Noxin. Noxin. And that's a... Uh... That's an opiate antagonist. So it's not going to have an effect on her body if she's not using the uh, opiate, which I don't think she was. Okay. Um, but, you know, also like, 
she's, I don't know why she would do that, right? But that, that's not important, right? right. So, she got it somewhere. Did she just get it from a pharmacy? Can they just get it? Yeah, so the Nox, yeah, we're gonna have a conversation right. about that yeah. to, uh, later on as well. So I'll explain what Noxon is in detail as well. Um, but you know, it was more about redirection and just you know, going back to the conversation, like, hey, remember we had a plan? Let's follow through with that. And that usually help a lot with with folks who um, go along with hand right? right? So, right? Um, so when I'm doing paperwork and stuff, that happens a lot of times. They'll be telling their whole life story, right? I'm asking you one question, right? You know, what's your, like, how long have you been experiencing homelessness? I've been experiencing homelessness because yada, 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 yada. Right, I'll go on for five, 10 minutes, right? So I, so a lot of times I have to redirect that person. I, you know, like, I, I see you, man. Like, I can see your situation right now, but let's focus on the stuff, questions. Let's get this done, and then we can make a child go afterwards, right? Um, but also just being there and also trying to listen to this person, right? That also helps a lot. Right? Um, but yeah. It seems you can't be in a hurry. Well, is it kind of well, the fact that the people from the cathedral are in, you know, some would be in a snit and some are just scared. But yeah. just the focus is there, and if it takes 10, 15 minutes, you just keep quietly pressing on. So I guess that's something. Right? Yeah, well, I mean, you, you got to overall see the end goal. End goal is no physical contact, no one gets hurt, no property gets damaged. And that takes time, right, to do that. So a lot of times, you know, when I'm with someone, I'll be spending 10, 15 minutes just to get someone to get up, right? Uh, and that's okay, because I'm not getting someone else to forcefully do the same exact thing that I would do to get them up. And that's diversion away from that 911 resource. Because that police officer is going to come in, probably do the exact same thing. Right, well, they can't. You know what I mean? Like, what what else could they do? They can't do anything other than tell them to leave, and they don't. You know, kind of forcefully escort them. Right. So that's kind of the same thing that we'll be doing, except we don't do that physical escort part, because to do the physical escort part, the reason why is because we want to get out that call. Right. They want to get this person on property so they can respond to other calls. Mm -hmm. Whereas your goal is to spend time to get this person moving. So that's the differences in goals. Yeah. It's also not appropriate for us to do that, but you know, that's the other thing. Yeah. We had a, a woman who was sort of, uh, I think she was high, she was in distress, and she came in to, it was just outside the kind of parish hall there, we were having a meeting, and mm -hmm. she kind of, I think she came in, kind of disrupted the meeting, and we mm -hmm. kind of let her out, but she, I think, Clearly wanted to have the Alpha House or, or something, just like some help. Yeah. Or not Alpha House. Anyway, um, there's another lady out there who lives in the building who is yeah. like, I've seen her a lot here before, um, but and she's like stayed with her a couple times and waited for the cars to show up yeah. to like pick her up, but she's like, it always takes so long. It does. And she had somewhere to be, so I was like, okay, I'll wait with her. Right. And I like called and yeah. I'm just kind of waiting. Yeah. Like everything ended up going well. Like yeah. it, it did take a long time for the people to show up. Yeah. And I, she, I tried to like sit with her for a while, and she seemed to like fit with me for a while, mm -hmm. like fairly just chill, hanging out. But then she would start to wander off, and I was like, I don't. Know, I feel torn here in my responsibility to yeah. like keep this woman safe because clearly she's like in a position where she could be taken advantage of to some degree because she is high, and that's kind of my worry. Okay. That if she wanders off somewhere, she's going to get into trouble. But I'm not going to, like, follow her through the streets. Yeah. And so I was like, do I go back into my meeting here? And so I, like, did step back in for a bit and then went outside just to see if the car had shown up. And I ended up finding her, like, kind of around the other side. Mm -hmm. The car ended up showing up. Mm -hmm. yeah. So 90% of the times, people will do that. They'll be talking, 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 and then there's one out. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. They're, like, even when a person is... Uh, under the influence, they're usually going to be fine. Um, so that if that can help with your worries. Yeah. Um, so it's not my responsibility now. No. Like... Also, the person is not in any medical distress or anything, right? So yeah. they could be just appearing, you know, mental distress, which you you've already kind of sat with her. You kind of calm that down. So that distress doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Right. So a lot of times people can just want off, and that's fine. 
right? So if that happens, you know, don't feel the need to chase the person down or anything like that. Um, you know, if if that's what they eventually, I mean, the decision is theirs, right? You want to go with the the, the help team or not? It's, it's up to them. So it's they don't want to go, you can't force them. Not if the staff can't force them either. Right? So um, you know, I was just kind of go back into a meeting and maybe check around and see if she's, she's around afterwards. And if she's not, then you know, she probably went out somewhere, found, found her group, right? That's kind of usually how, how it goes, right? So um, I know there is a sense of like, person is not sober and they can be easily taken advantage of. But when what I see in reality is that that's not the case. 100% of the time, pretty much. They're, they're still able to get, get around. They're still able to find their place, do their things, you know, because they, they've been adapted to, to that, right? So they are, um, how do I say this? They can do a lot more than I expect, than we can we expect, right, now, as outsiders. Um, they're survivors. They're absolutely. Survivors like wait this long. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're a lot more street smart than, than we expect. I know a lot of people expect, like, hey, you know, what happens if, you know, well, I mean, obviously, the person doesn't have clothes on, that's very different, right? And that's... Obviously, they might freeze, they might experience hypothermia, but if they, they got clothing on and stuff like that, and they're not asking support from you, you can, most likely they'll be okay. Yeah. yeah. What if they're like asking support from you? Yeah, well, it's more or less asking what kind of support they need. Okay. Well, yeah, because you don't know what they need, right? They might just need at the time, um, you know, warm clothes or stuff like that, in which you can call. The help team to for right so that's kind of like where you, if you don't know the answer just always ask yeah yeah and like once i've made the call yeah i guess my worry of leaving is that she's just going to wander off and then they're going to appear at this location and then she's not going to be there yeah so what, what help team does is well i mean they we they know the clients very well, right? So they will go around the area, then they will do a broad area search yeah. as well. Yeah. And usually that's how they find clients. Yeah. They're like, oh, it's gonna stay in one spot. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. That's um, a practical question. The help team, their number, do you just Google help team and you'll get their number? Yeah. It's what used to be the don't team. Oh, right, right. I can just give the number right now if you wanna save it. Much better acronym. <laughs> I'm amazed the other one lasted as long as it did. But everyone remembered the other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One second. So it's four zero three nine nine eight. Seven three eight. Eight eight? Yeah. I think. Yeah. So okay, four zero three nine nine eight seven three eight eight. Yeah. That's the average team. That's your main number. So the, so they are twenty four seven, so you can call them anytime. And if this, as long as you're in Calgary, you can call them. Um, they serve all around Calgary. But you should, in the case of somebody sleeping on the doorstep, you should uh, try to deal with the person yourself before. Ideally, after this training, that's the uh, objective, right? But if someone who is a lay person and have no experience, yeah, they'll get someone, you know, calling them is better than calling 911, if that makes sense, yeah. Um, and they'll usually divert that call to back to the help team anyways, if that goes through 911. Um, yeah, because that's not, that's not something that requires police. Yeah. So, yeah. Any other potential situations that we want to talk about? Mine are mostly just in the alley. People yeah. just kind of hanging out by the back door there, is it like leading to the parkade? Yeah. So if there's like a group of people there, I'm kind of, it depends on, I kind of read the situation and I yeah. either ask them or I request that they leave, that they shouldn't be hanging out there, or 
I just go through the garage, like that. I just open up the big door and, mm -hmm. and walk through there and just leave them be. Yeah, yeah. It depends. yeah. So it depends on the situation, right? Like, um, I think we're so, like, as society in general, we have internalized the criminalization of homelessness, right? Like, it's, like, if people are just doing absolutely nothing, is that, like, what I ask myself critically is, does that person need to leave right now? If they're just literally just sitting there, <laughs> they, like, you know, maybe dozing off, looking, daydreaming, I don't know. Right, just just sitting there doing absolutely nothing, right? Like, yeah, legally it's a loitering, but if you think about it, like those laws are mm -hmm. literally criminalizing homelessness because pretty much only people experiencing homelessness are loitering, right, in these areas nowadays. Um, and no one, and the reason why is because there's nowhere else to go. There's literally nowhere else to go. Where 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 else can it go? That's not considered a loitering, right? Mm -hmm. So it's 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 a balance of you know, am I really do I really need this person to leave right now because they are damaging property, they are being disrespect, disrespected, disrespectful, or doing stuff that's not okay on property, or is that person just really just sleeping there, eating food, or just chilling, right? In that case, then that's kind of the question that the question is that I invite you guys to kind of critically think what the situation might be. I'm just wondering, Matt, I don't know, um, I mean, a few times I've used the garage, I've, I haven't recently, but I've wondered, has it ever been an issue of, because it's a warm place, you'd think mm -hmm. if it, that big door opens, it takes a long time to close, if mm -hmm. people coming in and getting being warm there, almost like as they do at the library, or has that been an issue here? Yeah, yeah. yeah I haven't encountered too much, but it is always top of my mind, it's yeah. like leaving and going in. Yeah. yeah. So one, well, one big thing for me is like, I just wait until the door closes. Um, right before you drive in. That's yeah. the biggest preventative piece. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you see someone go in, it's like, hey, this is private property. There's no way out. They gotta get you to leave, right? You catch them out right there. That's the that's the biggest part. Um, so just if you just leave, wait a bit, and then until the close, door closes and driving, that's the biggest yeah. part. Make sure. Yeah. How you can prevent that. Right? Uh, that's what I usually do too. Like what's the you know, I live in Chinatown, so the garage opens, I'll I'll stand there for a bit until it closes and then like make sure no one's in. I'm not supposed to, and I just go up afterwards. So make sure that your access are, you know, are secure. Yeah. But uh, it seems like, you know, the back uh, when talking to Wendy, it seems to be less of an issue now. Um, with these people being there and doing more of the, you know, using substances, engaging in sex work, etc. cetera. Um, but also, like, when that does happen, we're not really here. It happens at midnight, right? Yeah. And stuff like that, so. Yeah. But we've been doing kind of active walks around there, so just check everyone's okay. We've been cleaning up. You know, like, a spot that's clean is always, you know, um, it, it detracts, you know, people making a mess there, right? It's like, oh, it's being maintained. Someone's looking after this place. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Oh, really? Yeah. I, would, I wouldn't have expected that there's kind of that uh, thinking, the, that awareness. Well, I, I mean, uh, just thinking about it, before it's dirty uh, and it's a secret place to hide, so they can do whatever they want to get eaten mess. But as the place is being cleaned up and as they see us coming in mm -hmm. to the alleyways and, and visibly checking out folks, they now know that this is a place where it's being asked to be monitored, it's being asked to be cleaned. There are people coming around, you know, to see if everything's okay. So then it's not as secure of a place anymore to do whatever they want to do, right? So Bill, can you tell us, since you started your work around here, how many situations have you had to intervene in? How many oh. times you've had to contact, um, call 911? I've done that zero times. Zero, zero 911 calls, I can tell you um, for sure. And I don't remember how many times on my head, how many times I've been interrupted. But probably at least one or two times per shift. And what, what are your, what shifts, what, what are you around? Just Sundays. Just Sundays. Just Sundays. Just Sundays, 8 to 12. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. At least one or two times on Sunday. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And is it the case too that, I mean, from, uh, from, 
the book that Wright County book that we read, there's a sense that, that everybody has kind of their neighborhood. Yeah. So is it that those who are here talking about they recognize it's clean? There are regulars. This is this is there's a group of folks who kind of the church area or these blocks are kind of their turf. So they would recognize because this is where they habitually come. Is that it's it's a bit hard effective? because now that we have so much moving around in terms of bylaw, transit, you're not seeing the same person every single time. Oh, okay. So it is hard for people to kind of claim communities okay. or territory because of that. Um, yeah, because I, the people that I've interacted, it just may take me months to come back to the same oh, okay. or see again. Okay. Okay. Um, doesn't mean they're not around the area. They're just very transient is what we're seeing. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which is hard for, for the church to feel the community. Yeah. Because it's not the same person every single time, mm -hmm. right? But. Do we have any stats on, on incidents that happen the other, between mm -hmm. 11 and 5 in the morning or other times when you guys aren't here? That I wouldn't have access to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But are we on a patrol route though for um, like the, this property? Like, because there are those I don't know if the help team or there's those in town from what Wendy said that are kind of regularly patrol through, especially through winter, check on folks. The police so, are very. I mean, the police spend a lot of time around here. Yeah, yeah, because it's their beat, like the downtown. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. the transit line is also just there, yeah. right? So it's 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 they very. They know about the alley and they know about yeah. the issues there. So. Yeah. Anytime we've interacted with them, they're very aware of some of the issues. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, health teams will do, they'll do like blocks. So downtown, they'll they'll drive around, but they're not, they're not driving an alley, right? Right. Um, but they'll just probably, you know, peeking and just seeing everyone's okay and stuff like that. So, yeah. We have the, do we get the security lights in the alley? Are those installed now? The mirror is here oh. and it's going to be installed today and oh, the wow. lights are being installed in the front, not like in the south lawn. They're not being installed in the alley. Ah, okay. Oh, okay. It's just because we would have to install them on Carter Place. Oh, and, okay. and so there's some yeah. issues there. Yeah. We can't install them on the building. Oh, okay. okay. What about like Church's side? We can't install them oh. on the building. Oh. Is it that's because of the sandstone? Like, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Makes sense. We might be able to, we would have to go through a lot of, you know, to deal with our heritage partners to see what yeah. uh, would work so that that is a possibility. But when we had the security study done, mm -hmm. um, they really focused on the South Lawn. Yeah. And oh, then, okay. And then um, a, a mirror so that we can see what's happening in the alley before yes. yeah. everybody goes into the alley in yeah. case it's not there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So that mirror, I think, is going to be installed. It's here, it's at over at the church now. I think the plan is to install it today. So, I mean, how long is it going to take before somebody just smashes it? <laughs> yeah, right. It's a big, heavy-duty mirror that's going to be installed quite high, so I don't oh, know the okay. answer to that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, yeah, so sometimes we, we just have to keep aware, like, what we can do is at the moment, right, interaction. That's kind of like what the skill sets are coming to. If you're not there, I mean, then that just really depends on the structures in place, right, that you have to kind of deter these kind of activities you don't want to have on property. So lighting, absolutely, can improve, right? Because the perception of, of safety, a lot of times is our perception of safety, right? Depends on your own comfort level, depends on your own, on, you know, um, what you perceive as safe. So most people perceive well-lit places as safe because you can see everything. You know, you can you can see the surroundings, etc. Right. So that's that's a that's important as well. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. The last part that maybe we can talk about is. Oh, I totally forgot this part of today's session. <laughs> but it's, uh, I was going to talk about insights into kind of addiction. But that we will talk about a lot more the next next time. Because we have a lot of seems like a lot of questions about what addiction might do to a person and what kind of mental health um, presentation they might have. Um, just uh, you know, explaining quite broadly 
there's probably just two types of drugs that people are using, uppers or downers. Uppers are stimulants, so that makes person hyper, makes them active, you know, um, and it can also appear as erratic. When a person using a downer, so those are like opiates, you know, alcohol, etc. It makes a person drowsy. Um, it makes a person sedated. You know, not a lot of active movement. So that's how you can generally differentiate the two different type of presentation. A person's active and moving around a lot. It's not going to be on a downer. A person is drowsy a lot. It's not going to be on a stimulant. Okay. Um, so that's generally how you can differentiate the two. Um, addiction is defined as continued use despite harmful uh, consequences. Harmful consequences include, you know, a decrease in your interpersonal relationship, right? You're damaging your friendship, damaging your family ties, not able to hold a job, not able to, you know, do meaningful activities, uh, and just your daily activity involves really seeking substances or and seeking ways to support that substance use. So that's taking the majority of your time. That's what addiction is defined medically. Um, and, and obviously that has detrimental effect on a person's you know, social relationship. And you know, a lot of times, you know, when last time we talked about what you said, the opposite of addiction is connection, right? Not sobriety. Unfortunately, the thing is when people are going through addiction, to the person they lose is connection. Right? They are no longer connected. So that kind of helped them into the cycle of not getting support, internalizing that, right? And then, you know, going down more and more and more, right? And so kind of what we call it, um, learned helplessness. What that means is, you know, a person will seek support at first, they will really try hard, but it keeps going falling to the crack, falling to the crack, falling to the crack. Eventually, they just internalize it, just start giving up. Whatever I do is not going to help me. That kind of mentality. That kind of happens a lot with people who are in addiction. Okay. Um, and, you know, a lot of times people have this misconception where they can just quit. It's not simple. Think about smoking. You know, how many people have quit smoking successfully, right? It's the kind of same kind of deal. You can't just quit. It's not. It's not simple as that, right? It, not only does it come with psychological effects, but medically speaking, when you're in withdrawal, it's a terrible sensation. You're feverish, febrile, right? You're you're vomiting. You're nauseous. You're not able to function as a person, right? And these are incredibly incredible. It's like a, the worst flu you've ever had. Right? These are debilitating medical conditions that can happen to someone. When someone's going through alcohol withdrawal, it's one of the deadliest uh, withdrawals that you can have because you can go into seizures, and that seizure can be fatal to your person. So that's why we have medical detox, and that's why we have medical treatment centers as well. People are going off substances. It's not easy. Right? Um, so understanding that can kind of help us with that empathy and compassion, just saying, like, this person is not just on drugs. And also the, the situations in which that creates and builds the environment where they are using drugs as a maladaptive coping mechanism is also important to recognize. People are not choosing to be addicted on substances. You know, they're not choosing to be living on the street, right? So just being aware of that is really important and may, you know, um, guide the way that you're interacting with this person. Maybe you give yourself a bit more time, a bit more patience, so you're not directing fault at this individual, right? Because there's just so much, so much social determinants of health that this person is not in control of. The housing situation, the finance situation, the family they're born in, the healthy child development, which is one of the most significant determinants of health that determines whether or not this person is going to live long or not. What kind of situation they're going to be living in, right? A rough childhood upbringing is going to significantly alter the person's attachment styles. Uh, their psychological way to be able to cope with stress, right? And unfortunately, a lot of people, they just learn to use substances as a way of coping. And that's not a fault of their own. It's because of the environment they've been born up in. So last week, we talked about intergenerational trauma, and that's where that comes in, where the family itself is not able to teach the kid the right way to cope. And, you know, the, the kid grow up, you know, not learning how to cope 
the stress adequately. And that, you know, unfortunately, passes down generation after generation. So those are kind of the general um, unfortunate trips that we have, right? It's not an individual fault, is the biggest thing I would say. Okay. okay. I think we, we talk a bit about effective communication as well when we talk about um, the situation. So, does anyone have any final questions? Helpful, thank you. Yeah, of course.